Hello, everyone. Welcome. Ooh, my phone is ringing. <laughs> Welcome to another special Global VMR. Today we have the Ohio House here with us, and we are super happy about it to have them. And we are going to start with a case. And if you have any question about the program, you can put in the chat because in the end we want to have a little talk with them to know more about the program. And then we have Dr. Patel here. He is he has been with us on Focus VMR. He presented a great case. If you don't watch, I really recommended you to watch. And Dr. Patel, if you want to say hi and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Sanjay Patel. I'm uh, Associate Program Director for the uh, Internal Medicine Residency at uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I'm always excited to be back on uh, CPS Solvers and uh, excited for our uh, Chief Residents, uh, Aditya, Chris, and Ellen to be able to share and discuss a case with you all. If the rest of the team wants to introduce um, Chris. Yeah. Um, so I'm Chris. I'm one of the uh, rising chiefs, kind of like Dr. Patel said. I'm actually from the Ohio area, from Cleveland originally. Uh, I went to Ohio State University for undergrad and then to OU, Univ uh, Ohio University for med school. And then uh, I've always liked Columbus, so I decided to kind of go back. Um, interested in uh, pursuing a career in cardiology. Uh, basically anywhere that'll take me, but uh, just really excited for next year and uh, being one of the chiefs and kind of helping make those new changes for next year and making things better. Uh, I'm Aditya, a rising chief as well. I'm actually from West Virginia, I did most of my schooling there. Um, I came to Riverside because I have a lot of family in the Columbus area and I really love the area and I loved our hospital a lot. And that's one of the main reasons why I'm going to be doing a chief year next year. Uh, like Chris, I'm also interested in cardiology as far as future plans. Hi everyone, I'm Ellen Tian. I'm actually from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised. So it was kind of natural for me to go back there to my hometown and do residency. Um, I went to undergrad at Ohio State University, and then I went to medical school at Ohio University, um, just like Chris Wasco. Um, I am very excited for my chief year with uh, my two compadres, and I'm excited to help improve the program. You forgot the best part of it, like you were born at Riverside, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I always say that I was born at Riverside as well. <laughs> Well, that's uh, so incredible to, to meet everybody and to, to see, Sanjay, that you recruit heavily from the, the local area and everybody returns back to the, to the uh, I guess, surrounding areas. So that speaks volumes about your institution. So uh, I really appreciate everybody coming on today. Um, so we, we're going to first start with a case and we'll be discussing uh, Dittia. Uh, we'll, we'll start the discussion with the case. And Ellen will be presenting. All right, so we have a 43-year-old man with progressive fatigue dyspnea for the past six weeks. He's had leg swelling for the past six months, which has recently increased along with orthopnea. He's sleeping um, on pillows. He feels his abdomen is distended. Um, he doesn't have any chest pain, palpitations, diarrhea, constipation, or urinary changes. He's also noticed losing weight for the past six months, but he's not really sure how much. Other reveal of systems is otherwise unremarkable. What do you think of the day? Um, So whenever I see a case involving dyspnea, I'm kind of automatically thinking about heart and lungs. Obviously, there's a broader differential beyond that, but with the uh, associated symptoms of leg swelling and this distension or apnea, I'm leading, toward, leading towards like a volume overload problem. What is kind of weird is that when I think about volume over pro overload problems like CHF or cirrhosis or a nephropathy, weight loss is kind of concerning. I usually don't associate weight loss with those pathologies. Uh, that's uh, an absolutely great um, start to thinking through this case. I think, uh, yes, what uh, what the, the optics of the case definitely allow us to consider the, the organs primarily responsible for respiratory function. So dyspnea could be 
a function or disorder of the the heart. It could be pulmonary. It could be a combination of both. But I really like that you had also thought about uh, swelling and edema, which could be secondary to um, al- hypoalbuminemia issues, which could be the kidneys, could be also the the uh, the liver as well. And uh, here, primarily with orthopnea and PND, that does allow us to focus in primarily on the heart. But we also have to keep an eye on other um, evolving issues. So as we obtain more information from Ellen, we'll see if we need to highlight the cardiopulmonary uh, region or do we need to look somewhere else. But with the PND orthopnea, that does give us a very high likelihood ratio of congestive heart failure. But then the question arises, why is this patient having congestive heart failure. The, the weight loss, like Aditya mentioned, the weight loss is very concerning. Like weight loss, we immediately system one thinking we we think is there poor access to nutrition, is there a hypermetabolic state, is there an inflammatory state, is there a malignancy at play? But you also have to realize like cardiac uh, causes, uh, something called cardiac uh, cachexia may also be at play. There could also be um, liver cirrhosis, if that was pre-existing, we don't have the past medical history, but uh, liver cirrhosis can cause accelerated cachexia. So we have to also entertain these thoughts. But this is a great start to, to, to thinking about this patient. Ellen, back to you. Actually, to Chris. We're going to switch back and forth since there's three of us. It makes it a little bit more fun. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, Chris. So for Alcroc 2, we'll go into the past medical history and some of the physical exam. Uh, So in his past medical history, he does have a history of stroke, hypertension, asthma, diagnosed recently about one year ago with CIDP. He also has depression and erectile dysfunction. Uh, He does have a father with a history of diabetes, but no other history in his family. And for his social history, he currently lives at home with his son and wife. He works at an automotive uh, rubber manufacturing plant. He uses no drugs, tobacco, or alcohol. Medications currently are albuterol inhaler, aspirin, atorvastatin, duloxetine, furosemide, pregabalin, semiglutide injected. And because of his CIDP, he's on IVIG every two weeks and rituximab starting two months ago. On his exam, vital signs uh, have a blood pressure of 128 over 72, heart rate is 77, respirations are 12, temperature is 98.1, O2 sat is 94% on two liters of nasal cannula, and his BMI is 28. In general, he does appear somewhat cachectic uh, with temporal wasting, but he's uh, in no acute distress right now. His neck does show signs of JVD, no thyromegaly and no lymphadenopathy or other changes in his neck. His heart is regular rate and rhythm with a normal S1, S2, no S3 or S4, and no murmur, gallops, or rubs. His lungs, uh, the upper lobes are clear to auscultation, no wheezes, rails, rowels, ronchi, uh, but he does have decreased breath sounds at the bases. He's currently non-labored. Respirations again are at 12. In his abdomen, he's distended somewhat soft, non-tender, but bowel sounds are present. In his musculoskeletal system, uh, he does have normal range of motion everywhere and no signs of synovitis or swelling. Uh, in his extremities, he does have pitting edema to the distal thighs and mild pitting edema to the arms, uh, no clubbing or rashes noted. in. Neurologically, he's alert and oriented times three. Because of a CIDP, he has zero out of five dorsiflexion to the ankles, Otherwise, his strength is five out of five throughout all uh, extremities and uh, nerve systems. And then uh, he does have somewhat decreased sensation to light touch at his fingers uh, and at his shins, which are stable from his previous diagnoses. Big block of information. A lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, Ditya, what, what do you think with uh, this these new details? How does that move the case ahead? He, with a history of hypertension and stroke, I guess, like I, I would be, I would say maybe he has some ischemic risk factors, which would, could lead to like a cardiac etiology of his symptoms. Um, the other weird thing is this CIDP, of course. Um, it looks like he's been started on medications for that. 
and he's still having pretty significant symptoms related to that. And then maybe there could be like a unifying diagnosis that would include a neuropathy with a volume overload problem. The temporal wasting also always draws my eye because that's just another kind of sign of long-term uh, poor health and could be like an end-stage process if it was like end-stage heart failure or uh, cirrhosis or something like that. So kind of just another hallmark of badness to come. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have a couple of competing uh, events going on here. And uh, namely, the, the, if you look at the past medical history, stroke hypertension, like you mentioned, patient is at risk for being a vascular path. And could there be, be um, ischemic cardiovascular disease here uh, that's currently unfolding? Uh, and then you look, there's some inhalers. So is there some pre-existing pulmonary disease, especially I'm looking at the social history, automobile factory. So uh, could there be exp occupational exposure, exposure to uh, brake lining dust or other uh, automobile components, which could cause occupational lung disease? So that's something to consider. But um, with the orthopnea, swelling, also now JVT, uh, that does lend credence to the theory of possible congestive heart failure. But then I'm sort of wondering if there's something else that's, uh, you know, rather this be a case just of congestive heart failure exacerbation, could there be some other processes simultaneously occurring? So not clear, but uh, like you mentioned, Aditya, the CIDP, that's interesting. That brings in another layer. And then looking at the medications, could this be, I'm not familiar with, IV, IG causing any complications, but that definitely has to be entertained at this level, rituximab as well. So the um, mul multiple side effects that could potentially occur from these, these medications, namely uh, possibly immunocompromised status, that could be something at play here. But um, I I'm going to sort of track back to what was highlighted in red, abdominal distension. If we... Uh, Combine that with what we initially had thought about with congestion, this could easily be um, going through what Ravi had mentioned. We just did a rehash of this yesterday. If we prioritize abdominal distension, could this be um, fluid? Could this be um, flatus? Could this be um, feces, sort of like a obstruction ileus? Or could this be a, uh, a tissue mass? So something along the lines of malignancy or any growth from any of the multitude of organs that exist within the abdominal cavity. So uh, if we, combining this with all of the discussion that we've made, it most likely could be fluid, but I would look for the abdominal examination to elicit um, some signs of, uh, of uh, abdominal ascites. So if there's a thrill, if there's, a, um, if uh, on percussion, if there's a change in, in, in the, um, uh, there's tympanic and dullness on the, on the abdomen. And uh, since we have Dr. Patel here, POCUS, if there was a uh, POCUS available to see if there's fluid within the abdominal cavity or if there's um, maybe distended bowels that could be causing this distended abdomen. So does that move the needle forward or ahead towards conge a congestive pattern? Could this be also, again, back to looking at the liver, looking at the kidney? The data will really help us in trying to manage where we should uh, expend our cognitive energy. So right now I'm still sort of confused where, where we should really focus in on, but I guess Alan and Chris will give us the next uh, piece of data then. Back to you. Yeah, let's go over some labs that we got on initial workup. So we have a white blood cell count of nine, hemoglobin of 15 and platelets at 443. On BMP, we have a sodium of 138, potassium of 4.1, chloride 100, bicarb 29, BUN of 9, creatinine of 0 0.8, and calcium of 9.1. On liver function test, we have a total protein of 6.8, albumin at 3.1, bilirubin of 0 0.3, otherwise AST, ALT, and alkaline phosphatase is normal. PT INR is 14.7 and INR 1.2. On urinalysis, we have 
a protein of 30 and then a spot protein creatinine ratio at 0 0.4. Troponins were also ordered on admission, and the high sensitivity troponin um, was 33, and rechecked three hours later was 33, which is mildly elevated but adynamic. We have an NT Pro BNP at 452. An EKG had normal sinus rhythm but with low voltage throughout. On echocardiogram, we have an EF of 65% with trace pericardial effusion no left ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular hypertrophy, and a normal pulmonary artery systolic pressure. The thyroid uh, function test was also normal. Very interesting. This, this changes the game here. What do you think uh, that the uh, vast amount of data here might help us along the course? I like this original workup. I mean, we were kind of talking before, you know, we talked about hypoalbuminemia being a possible cause. I don't think at this level that that's a big contribution. Additionally, based on the urine testing, it doesn't seem like we're losing a lot of protein through there. Um, the cardiac labs are mildly elevated. Um, so again, it kind of pushes me towards that aspect. And then while the echo is relatively normal, it could be half path, but then this low limb voltage uh, is kind of a, it's, that's a buzzword for me for things like cardiac amyloidosis or a, um, yeah, just things like cardiac amyloidosis that could be causing this presentation. And then that would also fit in with his history of a neuropathy, uh, not necessarily CIDP, but would work with a, uh, a, a monoclonal gammopathy causing a neuropathy plus a CHF like thing. Yeah, I really love that pick up on the, the low voltage criteria. So uh, for those of you that, that um, may not remember low voltage criteria on EKG, so you, you take the the limb leads and it's five millimeters or, or less and 10 millimeters with the precordial leads. And that signifies low voltage and then your quick sort of differential diagnosis, I sort of think about what interface may obstruct the readings on the the um, on the leads between the heart and the lead. So if you think about, there could be fat, so um, obesity. There could be air, so um, a um, uh, COPD or hyperinflated lungs, pneumothorax. That could be or could that disrupt the interface. There could be fluid, so sort of akin to what we had gone through with the abdominal distension. So fluid could also like a pericardial effusion or a very large pull effusion could also uh, obstruct that interface. So you get low voltage criteria. So a couple of things to, to think about when, when um, faced with low voltage criteria. And uh, uh, they had astutely mentioned um, infiltrative disorders of the heart, which also could cause uh, low electrical potentials being generated within the heart. So any sort of infiltrated process could cause this. And one of the ones that you brought up was amyloidosis, and that could be um, considered. I don't see a, um, a gamma gap teleprotein minus the, so we're not at four, but gamma gap may not exist, especially in advanced cases of say a multiple myeloma. So you may have a normal anti gap, but I guess during the initial portion you may have an elevated gamma gap. So um, the the um, echo here with the ejection fraction is sixty five percent. Yeah, they could be half puff, and uh, I agree with the album being three point one. Not seriously low to have such a devastating presentation. Still kind of confused. The pro BMP I would anticipate it to be very high, but the four fifty two is not terribly high to explain this. So again. Um, how how could you interpret a low pro BMP in the context of congestive valve failure? Namely, in, in obesity, you could have a low, a false um, negative pro BMP, but um, you can also have it in a devastatingly sick heart, a low pro BMP when they're having severe congestion. So a few things to think about. And I think in infiltrative disorders, you could potentially have a low BNP as well. So I like that theory. And there could be a case of infiltrative cardiomyopathy unfolding right in front of our eyes. But uh, I would like to get more data here to see what will be the next test of choice. Yeah, or, excellent. Yeah, I would uh, 
kind of think about what what to do next, or if there's some uh, some progression of the patient's condition that might indicate us towards a possible diagnosis in this case. Are we back to you, Chris? Now? Yeah, back to me this time. <laughs> Um, so that's exactly what the team did is they wanted to kind of find out more about a possible infiltrative disease. So a lot of the workup at this point was based on that. Um, so the next thing that they got, uh, looking for what Aditya mentioned was the cardiac amyloid, especially was, uh, the free light chains, which did show a cap of 76 and a lambda of 359. And that ratio is 0.21, which is abnormal. Uh, the SPEP and immunofixation for, in the serum, uh, they did show lambda light chains. Uh, and a UPEP and a urine immunofixation did also show lambda light chains. And then a PYP scan was done after that, which showed actually no myocardial uptake and a grade zero or the uh, heart to lung ratio of 0 0.97, which is all normal. In the cardiac MRI, it did show edema, a pericardial fusion, uh, but no infiltrative consistency at all in the heart. Uh, and then this went so far in the, the uh, uh, pre uh, or the uh, pre thought for having infiltrative disease was so high that this person ended up going under a left heart catheterization and an endomyocardial biopsy, uh, which showed no amyloid light chains uh, in the actual heart tissue itself. And that's the next aliquot. Oh, wow. That's, that's very interesting. Now the, we, we had this proposed theory of amyloidosis, but there are many other thoughts uh, or possibilities that could cause um, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, but um, this sort of strikes amyloidosis out. What do you, what do you think? Or what did you think at this point, Aditya? So, yeah, I like this workup for cardiac amyloidosis. I think at the beginning, you should be doing a monoclonal gammopathy, like serum workup with SPAB immunofixation, uh, and then simultaneously, like a PYP scan. The PYP scan is really useful for ruling out um, TTR amyloid. And then your SPEP immunofixation, UPEP are more related and more related to a light chain amyloidosis. So we do have something going on as far as a monoclonal gammopathy, but it doesn't seem to be affecting the heart as much. And then the cardiac MRI is pretty interesting too. In the fact that cardiac MRI can be very useful for detecting an amyloid, like a cardiac amyloidosis, not necessarily differentiating between the two major types, but it's also pretty good at detecting other types of infiltrative disease, such as sarcoidosis uh, or other types of cardiomyopathies like uh, HCM or things like that. So the fact that that's relatively normal too, kind of a pushes me away from this being primarily cardiac and etiology. Yeah. So what's interesting, the, the, the history physical very much was in favor of a congestive uh, uh, cardiac process. But yeah, now we'll have to possibly entertain all the other causes here. So um, again, the albumin, I'm not very convinced that that's causing such a devastating presentation. So where lies the the answer here yeah i'm kind of confused at this point and i like to see what the team i guess their thinking was when they moved through this case but um yeah i'm not very convinced also with the cardiac mri a cardiac mri can i don't remember the sensitivity specificity but can miss or may not give you the findings but the the biopsy would uh, definitely gives you the answer there um but routinely we always um learned that doing an abdominal fat pad biopsy could give you the answer or diagnosis for amyloidosis on board exams. But um, I'll send it back to, to Chris and also um, Ellen to see what the next part of the case is. Yeah, definitely a lot of moving pieces here. Um, the next aliquot, um, which is uh, slightly out of order to what happened in real life, just for the purposes of our discussion and learning here. So next, I would like to review uh, what was found on the CT scan. So CT chest, abdomen, pelvis um, was actually at the beginning of workup, but now we will present it. And it shows patchy airspace disease with trace pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, and subcutaneous edema, also with ascites and mesenteric edema. There is hepatosplenomegaly, 
and mediastinal and pelvic lymph nodes. A lytic lesion of the left iliac crest was also found. So this lytic lesion was also biopsied, which showed plasma cell neoplasm with lambda light chain. Oh, wow. The tunnel of truth. I also forgot. Yeah, we, ne we didn't get a uh, abdominal pan CT or chest, uh, abdomen, pelvis. So that definitely would help us when the initial diagnostic workup was ruling out the majority of the thought that we had. But um, I'll send it back to you, Dithya. What do you think? Yeah, this definitely has a lot of new findings. Uh, I think that we, we knew about the pericardial effusion. The pleural effusion could also be just attributed to volume, um, the, as well as the ascites and subcutaneous edema. I think the hepatosplenomegaly is worth thinking about because I don't have a good etiology for that at this time. And then it does look like we have some lymph adenopathy that we didn't catch on physical exam. Uh, as far as the lytic lesion with the monoclonal gammopathy that we found on our serum testing, it would be make me concerned for something like multiple myeloma. And I would think about uh, bone marrow biopsy as my next step. Yeah, yeah. I think... Uh... I like the thought of looking at the bone marrow to see if the the there are plasma cells that could be more than ten percent. I'm not seeing though well, if you go through crab. Um, what I do remember, you don't always necessarily have crab manifestation. We're looking at the calcium here. If we adjust for the albumin, is still say it's three point one to point eight, so still not relatively high. But you may not actually have crab manifestations. But then you'll have to have a bone marrow plasma cell um, finding of maybe more than 60%. So the bone marrow may give us the answer. So always be wary that uh, the the um, maybe the gamma gap, maybe crab findings may not be there, although we do have bone findings here. But um, do we have a, a bone marrow biopsy? Back to you, Ellen or, or Chris. I think Chris may be frozen. Um, so I can go ahead and release the last aliquot here. So yes, we do have a bone marrow biopsy, which shows increased plasma cells, six to 10% with decreased CAPTA to lambda ratio. Um, and other workup that was also um, worked up at this time was a total testosterone level, um, which was 30, very low and then a VEGF level was greater than 700. Interesting the, with this VEGF, um, what prompted that work up? So thinking through, you know, all of the pieces of the puzzle here, um, kind of a, um, Occam's razor versus Hickam's dictum case here. Is everything related? Um, how do we piece together everything into unifying diagnosis? Um, so thinking through, right, we have a patient that's fluid overloaded. We have evidence of a gammopathy, um, a lytic bone lesion, hepatosplenomegaly. Um, so at this time um, with polyneuropathy as well, um, the diagnosis of poems um, was in question here, which is why a VEGF level was ordered. Oh, very interesting, very interesting, yeah. Um, Aditya, any reflections? I, uh, yeah, that, that's like, that, that makes a lot of sense looking back at everything because if you look at his history too, um, kind of weird for someone this young to have erectile dysfunction and then uh, one of the criteria for poems is endocrinopathy, so that would satisfy that. And additionally, the neuropathy, if I remember correctly, um, it's not uncommon for poem cases to be diagnosed with CIDP early on because they both cause like a demyelinating pattern on e or on testing and stuff like that. Uh, and I think that's often the first sign or symptom of a poem syndrome too. So I think with that diagnosis, we would get his presenting complaints of dyspnea, volume overload. We would also touch on his history of CIDP and erectile dysfunction. Uh, and it 
just feels like a good unifying diagnosis for a lot of what he has going on. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I mean, I mean not to sort of jump the gun there, but um, yeah, we went through the process starting with maybe a congestive picture, looking at the, the heart and maybe also keeping an eye on the other organs where albumin may be low, but with this devastating uh, um, syndrome at, at play, that does explain uh, all of the different presentations, especially a young patient coming in could be misunderstood, like you mentioned, CIDP, but not recognizing all the other um, findings here. And then the anti-VGF antibodies is, is a, definitely a big indicator that you're thinking about POEM syndrome. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, awesome case. I've never seen a, a case of POEM syndrome before, but uh, something to think about. One of the maybe rarer cases uh, of, of uh, multi-system sort of disorders that we also have to, to think about and may rarely see and misdiagnose as well. So fabulous case. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you, Chris, for, for bringing this case to us. And it just uh, shows us the, the uh, wide variety of cases that you see there at uh, uh, in, at your institution. So I want to applaud uh, all of you as well as Sanjay for, for bringing everybody here and presenting such a fabulous case. Back to you, yeah. Deborah. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that when we were first hearing about this case, it just like the next step, the next step, everything was like totally different than what I would expect next. And then more and more being revealed. And all I wanted to say at the end was, what about the skin findings for poems? But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun seeing this case. So very cool. Definitely something that we it's rare, but we see a lot of stuff at Riverside. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and this this a case is a great example of why we come here and learn together to to learn about different cases that we might not learn, uh, hear of, and cases that we may not may miss in the real world. So uh, we're here to to improve our uh, ability to diagnose and not miss such devastating diagnosis like this. So definitely one to put on your radar screen if it does if it does come across um, in your practice. Um, should we go on De to Deborah to asking questions? Oh, thank you for the case. It was really good. So yeah, I think I can start with the questions and I want to know what made uh, you choose the, the program. Maybe Chris can answer this one. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start. For me, you know, I, I wasn't from the Columbus area. I have family here who kind of first put Riverside on my radar, but it, it was really sold to me whenever I did my first rotation here in the ICU as a fourth year medical student. Um, we're a big tertiary center with, um, I think it's like a 900 bed to 1000 bed hospital, but we don't have a lot of fellow presence here. And so when I was doing my ICU rotation, the interns and the PGY2 were managing so much. They were very involved with patient care and make actually involved in making decisions. And they got to do all the cool stuff that you'd want to do in an ICU, right? So procedures, intubations, A-lines, whatever, chest tubes. And they got first dibs on all of that. Uh, despite how busy and how hard they were working, they just had a great time. And that culture really drew me there, um, especially with how great our attendings are, like Dr. Patel. And uh, yeah, despite being a stressful rotation, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, I definitely second that. Um, I Like I said, I'm originally from the Ohio area, Columbus. So I, I knew of Riverside. I, I didn't know it was a thousand beds when I applied, but I definitely do now. But um, when I, this was before when we were still doing in-person interviews. This is like before the bad times. So the, the night before, you know how you always do the dinner and then the, the day, the next day you do the interviews and everything. Uh, I just remember out of all the places that I had been to, when I went to the dinner beforehand and actually interacted with the residents just to see how everybody was doing, it was probably one of the first times that I actually saw all of the third years, the second years, the chiefs out, the first years, all interacting with each other and actually like friendly to each other where it wasn't fake, where people were asking about their other uh, friends' lives and uh, how's their kids doing and like, oh, how's that project going? It wasn't fake in any sense. It was actually like, people who are friends hanging out for dinner and then they also happen to work with each other. And then after getting here, realizing that 
oh, it's going to be me putting in the A lines and the CVCs. I have started having a lot more fun too. And uh, that was definitely interesting. So now I'm up to words of like 200 procedures since I've been there and lots of pairs and TCs and lots and lots and lots of procedures. And being able to be the first dibs and being the one at the bedside doing these things and thinking through cases and being the one to suggest uh, for all these cases um, what I want to do next and how to work it up and being able to follow those through just made it that much better of an experience every single time I've been there. Yeah, in addition to everything Adithia and Chris said, um, it was the people and the comprehensive education. So just not to reiterate anything that has been said, but our relationships with our attendings are also um, really collegial. Um, oftentimes we are able to reach out at any time in terms of patient care, or if you wanna get involved in any type of project with them outside of um, normal work life, um, everyone is so readily available to help you. Great. I think Shayna has a question, but probably she's in the library. So I think the, her question is, what makes your program unique? I think that goes back to what Adithia was talking about, too. I love how our program is a size of 18, um, so it's a moderate size program. Um, we're in a tertiary care center, so we see a lot of different pathology in a great um, metropolitan city of Columbus. Um, and we get a lot of referrals actually from the surrounding um, Ohio, like smaller towns and cities, um, because Ohio Health is a big, big system. Um, and we have, you know, a I think, I don't know the exact number, but around like 10 different hospitals. So Riverside, our hospital, we get a lot of the referrals um, sent from the other smaller Ohio Health hospitals. Um, so we see, you know, a lot of different things. Um, we do have, you know, a bigger university next door. Um, so the only thing that we don't see here is transplant, but everything else um, we have at Riverside, all of the different specialties. Uh, there, there was another question. Let's see, uh, somebody had asked, like, uh, Rafa, you have a question. You wanna mention it? Yeah, like, like, uh, what are your favorite things to do about living in the city? There's lots of stuff. Uh, it's not as uh, great as like a beach place because it is kind of starting to get cold now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff inside right now, but. Uh, Ohio is kind of a funny place, especially Columbus, because it is such a big city um, and a huge collection of multiple different populations, lots of different cultures. We have a huge Somali population here. Um, and one of the things that's also weird about how big the city is, is in 15, 20 minutes, I can be in like a farm town um, or like a smaller little city or just going to Hocking Hills and just staying up in a cabin uh, at like a wooded area and uh, all these different caves and different parts of Ohio that are much more set to like a rural or slower speed. But then in another 15 minutes, I'd be back in Dayton or in Cincinnati or back in Columbus. And there's everything is so far and so close all at the same time. Um, you get a little bit of everything. And uh, my parents are still in Cleveland, so I still am able to go home and stuff too. But um, being in Columbus, there's so much variety of different things to do in just a short amount of time it's it's great there's lots of stuff yeah i have a question what do you, all of you ellen chris aditya um do as a program together what what kind of or for mental health and well-being which is very important uh, what do you like to do uh all the residents outside of the hospital yeah, we have well, Ellen here, who's like our wellness coordinator, so she probably is the best person to talk to. Yeah, I would love to talk about this. So this year, um, we kind of revamped like how we wanted our well-being curriculum and um, 
extracurriculars to work. Um, so we actually focus on both inpatient and outpatient activities. So yesterday, actually, um, once a month, we have like a wellness Friday and we did white elephants with everybody, which was a great success. Um, everyone brought in gifts. We limited to like $5 or less. So it's not something, you know, you have to go crazy about, but it was a great time. We put on some holiday music and we went around the room and did white elephant. We limited everyone to one steal. So it didn't get too crazy. Um, but yeah, everyone had a lot of uh, fun time together. Um, we've had other things inpatient like a scavenger hunt. We did like a little bingo speed dating. Um, outside of the hospital, we're trying to do like quarterly um, get togethers with like large get togethers with everybody. So we had a trivia night um, back in fall and we want to have a board game night um, during the winter. Um, and then there's like back um, when, you know, the weather was nicer, we would have, you know, weekly happy hours or residents um, in the clinic, outside in the clinic, they would kind of uh, plan for a place for everyone to eat and drink at. And then we would just gather and talk about life together. So we have a, lo we have a little bit of everything in terms of allowing our residents to get to know one another inside and outside of the hospital. Uh, that just speaks volumes about uh, how an institution program is is very well in, invested in their residents and trainings that they're allowing for or, or promoting a lot of these wellness um, uh, wellness sort of activities outside the hospital or inside the hospital. So that's that uh, just makes the program very attractive to applicants to to apply. And um, uh, I had another question, like with. Sanjay being there, who teaches uh, in in many different con um, I guess conventions or uh, conferences, Pocus. Uh, how are you all with learning Pocus from uh, Dr. Patel? Uh, I I've learned a lot. Uh, it's I didn't have a ton of exposure in medical school. Maybe if you were doing like the anesthesia, like uh, fun outside, like club uh you got like some opportunity to do some of it for whatever reason um but after being here it, the whole time uh focus is incorporated to basically everything um so when we're in the icu obviously putting lines and tubes and things in and doing paracentesis making sure that you have procedural competency with the focus and uh, just ultrasound is like one major part of it but on top of it, it's something that changes management in the ICU and on admissions constantly for me and a lot of other people in the hospital. So um, seeing, being able to just put a probe on somebody's chest and saying, is the heart good or not, basically, uh, changes everything in an instant in the ICU. Um, but even during admissions on nights and things, uh, Dr. Patel uh, leaves us his uh, bedside ultrasound uh, tablet and his uh, his wand and we end up, I always take it with me with the intern whenever I'm teaching or on service, I'll take it with me and I'll say, okay, what do you think is going on? Tell me about your physical exam. And then afterwards I say, okay, do you want to check? And so uh, I'll have them run the ultrasound probe and I'll help uh, move things around and show them different things that I'm looking for and different things that I'm thinking. And then, uh, the more and more that I've done it, not only have I gotten quicker at finding different things that I need to and being able to teach it, um, but other people are very interested in it too. Like all the interns say, can we please go scan this person? Or even if it's somebody on the floor who's having an issue, let's go up and scan them. Let's see if there's something in their heart or their lungs. Um, let's see if they have uh, ascites somewhere. It's just more fun things kind of to do and helps change everything on nights rather than just guessing or trying to say, oh, should we get a CT or what should we do for tomorrow or tell the day team? It just changes everything in that moment. Brilliant, brilliant. How about you, Alan, how's your um, exposure to POCUS been? Yeah, very much like Chris, because we went to the same med school. So I really did not get much education at all. But I feel like after three years so far, I feel very comfortable with POCUS, um, taking it to bedside and doing like a full, um, you know, rundown of heart, lungs, um, you know, abdominal cavity. Um, so all the basics that you really need. Um, so I'm really, you know, grateful for education here at Riverside and grateful to Dr. Patel for bringing his knowledge of POCUS and excitement for POCUS to our program. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, we, we share that same sentiment. Uh, Dr. Patel's board focused uh, to CPS EMRs on Tuesday, and that was just uh, great for, for our platform. And we look forward to him and probably all of you bringing more cases to, to CPS and, and learning from all of you. And every time I see tweets from your program, uh, I'm always thinking Dr. Patel's there teaching everybody pointy K ultrasound. And, and then I see that he played dodgeball. Is, is that a... a, a um, uh, sport that all of you play there together maybe dr patel plays um in another league or something no that was a very fun um opportunity we had with some of our osu ohio state university colleagues where they invited us um to a sports tournament so there's dodgeball there was basketball involved at one point um and i heard that uh we we won Oh, brilliant, brilliant. We, we did. We not only did we win, we crushed the other team. <laughs> Yeah, question about so you're between two other cities, Cincinnati and uh, Cleveland. Which uh, where does Columbus is uh, I guess support or affinity light it more towards the Cleveland teams or or Cincinnati? I have to say Cleveland since I'm from there, as much as it pains me. So I have to go Cleveland. Uh, there's a few mixes of both, uh, Cleveland and Cincinnati people here, but I think we get more Cleveland sports, uh, like, uh, over the antenna to the TV anyway, but I, that might be different, but, uh, I, I say Cleveland, I think more people are Cleveland than Cincinnati here. People really just care about OSU here for college sports more than anything. Yeah. It's, it's probably the only one that like the whole city changes to like a scarlet and gray for the whole thing. And then when the Michigan, Michigan, when they come here, every every M in the entire city is like blocked off with like red duct tape. Uh, and you could just walk around and like all of Ohio State is just everywhere. It is crazy how much the city turns out for just Ohio State compared to any other sports team. Yeah, I'm also sure that's a big topic of conversation with your patients and a good way to break the ice uh, with patients. So sports is definitely uh, something that uh, brings everybody together, especially in a, in a town like yours where you have great college uh, sports activities. Could you tell us a bit about food? I think somebody in the chat, I think Deb, Deborah, you want to ask that question? She loves food. No, I was asking uh, what we need to eat when we go visit Columbus and uh, something that you all like. Yeah, I feel like there's something for everyone here speaking to, you know, Columbus being a large metropolitan city. Um, this is actually the skyline if you guys are interested <laughs> behind me right here. So it's really pretty and um, we have different pockets around Columbus. So it's very unique, right? It's large large city or capital of Ohio, but in the sprawling areas, we have different pockets, um, such places such as like Italian village, German village. Um, we have, you know, Asian food, um, you know, Spanish, everything. Like one of the things that I tried like this past year was Peruvian food, um, which was really good. So literally like anything that you want like I feel like you can find here in Columbus and uh, we're often like a testing city um, in the U.S. meaning like a lot of different companies come here to test different food concepts actually so it's a great place to be. Yeah like BB Bop was one of those that started here um, like the so the other things too is that I'll remind you that I went to Ohio State here for four, five years because I did engineering for undergrad so I had like the extra co-oping here um, and then I did OU and I've rotated here and then I'm a resident here for three years and then I'm going to be here next year. I will not even come close to like a quarter of all the restaurants that you can go to here. There's just too many. Like I would need to come back like every single day for the rest of my life to try every single thing. Um, so there's like the classic chains like Ellen was saying, like where a lot of them start here. And then there's so many like just locally owned or family owned businesses and uh, restaurants here too that are just uh, because it is a metropolitan center and like there's so many people that move here from other countries too it's the local eatery for like their population and their culture too so you get to really try authentic dishes not only just like the brand name like mcdonald's and bb bop and stuff too it's really really a cool place 
I'm, I'm very impressed that a lot of you are local and chose to to attend a program that's close to to where your roots are. Do you envision after doing fellowship? You named a, a couple of um, considerations for fellowship down the road. Do you envision coming back to the area and practicing? That's like a pretty common thing for us at Riverside. Actually, if you go through a lot of our specialty faculty and even our hospice faculty, they either did their residency at Riverside or they just have ties to this area for uh, whatever reason. So a lot of people just end up coming back to Columbus and I, we bragged about our culture within our program, but the culture within the hospital is great too. And I think that's a big driver for why people want to come back here. Uh, I would love to come back to Riverside after a cardiology fellowship for sure. I second that. That's that's an easy, yeah. I would love to be back in Columbus, especially at Riverside, just doing giving back to the place that basically brought me up in medicine. And I also echo those sentiments as well. I don't think I uh, told everybody in the beginning, but I'm interested in GI, especially hepatology. Um, so yeah, I would love to, wherever I go for training, eventually come back to Columbus. That's incredible. That again speaks volumes about the program and I guess what, what the way you train there and the environment and climate that it attracts you to come back and, and settle down there and, and contribute back to the program. So that just... Uh, speaks uh, a lot about um, the environment that Dr. Patel, your program director, leadership um, promotes there. So uh, yeah, I really applaud that. Any last questions before we wrap it up? We have like three minutes. Rafa, Deborah, Shema. I guess one last question is, um, how diverse is the population that you take care of? Um, fairly diverse. I mean, like, like we've been saying, we're in one of the major cities of Ohio. Um, it is predominantly Caucasian, but we probably do, we probably serve more of the underrepresented population than some of our other hospitals in the area. Uh, we also, through our clinic, because of lack of insurance and things like that, we get a lot of the immigrant population in the area too. Uh, specifically, we got a lot of Somali patients, a lot of Vietnamese patients, uh, a lot of Hispanic patients. So it's it's fairly diverse. Yeah. Yeah, um, I recently wrote an abstract for uh, one of our QI projects, and it's about colon cancer screening in our clinic. Um, a lot of different things can go into, you know, completion of colon cancer screening. And one of the statistics that we found was about 41% uh, of our patient population in our clinic, outpatient clinic, um, were non-English speaking, um, as well as had Medicaid insurance, um, which causes, um, you know, some difficulties and barriers um, to overcome in terms of, you know, colon cancer awareness and screening. So it was something um, great that uh, we have that population we can work with to serve the underserved um, in our outpatient setting. So we do have a pretty diverse population um, that we, you know, see. Just one last question then. Do you go to any of the neighboring um, academic institutions, university institutions do rotations? How easy it is? Is it from your program to facilitate these outside rotations? So I think like, like Ellen mentioned, as far as academic needs, the only thing we don't have here is transplant. Um, as far as getting rotations just for like fellowship purposes and stuff like that, we all kind of came up during the COVID era. So we probably have less experience with that as previous years. Uh, I know historically we've done a pretty good job of getting people to outside rotations uh, since that's starting up now again. And I think Ellen actually might be doing an outside rotation too. Yeah, I am. Um, so I will be rotating in uh, Pennsylvania at uh, Allegheny. So it is possible from our program. I know during COVID, you know, a lot of regulations, but now they're very supportive about patients going to seek out, you know, their own experiences um, elsewhere at other institutions. All right, Raf. I think we're at the one o'clock mark. Yes. Dr. Patel, any last words uh, about the program? It was really great to, to meet Chris, Alan, Aditya. All of you are, are uh, fantastic. The case 
you presented was was uh, very interesting. You presented it incredibly well, and uh, the 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 chat really appreciated the case. And definitely, I'll read up on it afterwards. It's not something I commonly see, but I, you definitely did teach me a lot of things today. So that's uh, the point of this whole exercise: is to keep learning, so lifelong learning. But uh, I really appreciate that the Ellen and Chris, a uh, fantastic, marvelous job, and it was great to learn uh, about your program from all of you and all your varied interests and, and hobbies and life within the program. Definitely somewhere that everybody should consider when applying, um, when when looking in the Ohio uh, North area. So, Dr. Patel, I'll leave you with the last words. I'll be very, very brief because I'm now at uh, my daughter's basketball game. So I just get loud and listen in front of us. I want to thank you, uh, Ravi Rafa, Dadir, for having us on. And uh, thanks to Andrea for having a fantastic job and uh, educational. And uh, uh, like I wrote there in the chat, awesome. they made it, made it awesome today, every day. And they make my job easy and enjoyable. Yeah, I, I kind of echo being in program leadership as well. Yeah, the, the the interaction and working with residents and medical students just makes uh, work much, much more interesting. And um, I just, just I can envision Dr. Patel working with all of you. Just his job is that much better. Uh, we, we couldn't really hear because he's outside of the basketball game, but I, I do really echo that. And uh, I definitely, if I'm in that area, I'd love to work with all of you. So I really appreciate you spending your valuable time this morning coming on and then bringing this case. This case was really great, good or great. And um, it, was, it was just incredible to, to learn about your program. And Dr. Patel's a, a lifelong friend of CPS. So we'll look forward to collaborating on a focus for you more again. Any last words, Rafa, Deborah? Yeah, thank you, everyone. And we hope uh, we will see you all soon. And we all invited to come back and present new cases for us, especially focus is something that we have been learning here. So yeah, have a great weekend, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.